My name is Madeline Narduzzi and I'm a summer intern here at the Center for Conservative Women. I'm a rising senior at the University of Dallas and I'm majoring in politics with an ethics concentration. Thank you for joining us today as we host Emily Jashinsky. Emily is the director of the National Journalism Center. She is also a culture editor at The Federalist. Emily previously covered politics as a commentary writer for the Washington Examiner. Prior to joining the Examiner, Emily was the spokeswoman for Young Americans Foundation. She, was, she has interviewed leading politicians and entertainers and appeared regularly as a guest on major television news programs, including Fox News Sunday, Media Buzz, and the McLaughlin Group. Her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Post, Real Clear Politics, and other outlets. Emily is a member of the National Journalism Center's Board of Governors and previously served as a director of Young America's Foundation. Originally from Wisconsin, she is a graduate of the George Washington University, where she helps lead her YAF chapter. Please join me in welcoming Emily. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you guys having me. I'm excited to talk to you. I read your essays. They were really good, so I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about as we go over those. I'll start by just giving you guys an overview of the problems with modern journalism, which an overview of the problems with modern journalism is kind of an interesting phrase, right? Because you can give an overview, but there's the problems are so numbered that it would take a lot longer than the time that we have here today, or maybe even the time that we have here on this earth to have that conversation, uh, because of the problems, again, there, there are so many of them. Um, and you guys probably know that. And that's sort of one of the most important windows um, or the most important ways to understand um, the problems with modern journalism is simply to think of the problems that you have with modern journalism as a reader. You guys all know this instinctively because you're consumers of news. Um, and as a consumer of news, you are probably really confused right now. Am I wrong? <laughs> right? We're all extremely confused. What's happening with HR1? where people are being called racist for opposing the bill. The President of the United States uh, walked out on stage yesterday and said that this was Jim Crow in the 21st century, that this was an assault on free and fair elections. Because the media is now so aligned with the ideological left, not the partisan left, not the Democratic Party, but the ideological left, because the media is now so aligned with them, this was accelerated in the Trump era, you end up with the media parroting instead of doing the endless fact checks that they would do on Donald Trump. They sort of parrot the narrative that we are now witnessing an assault on free and fair elections. And that leaves news consumers incredibly confused. Because if what we were witnessing was a new Jim Crow, I mean, that's a huge deal, right? <laughs> that's a huge deal. Um, and there would be, you know, you'd think there would be bipartisan outcry. And that implicates the entire Republican Party essentially in disgusting and despicable racism, right? If that's what we're seeing, if Republicans in this country are seeking to implica implicate a new era of Jim Crow, that means they are racist. So the left agrees with that, right? If I were having this conversation um, with somebody on the left, they would say, exactly. Exactly. But the problem we arrive at here is that we don't have a media calling balls and strikes. We have a media who is going right along with that ideological narrative that yes, this is voter suppression on the level of 21st century Jim Crow and Republicans are thus universally racist, unless you're like Jeff Flake or some sort of like anti-Trump conservative who makes your money critiquing conservatives. And then they'll even call them racist when they get the opportunity. So that's what's happening here. Think about yourself as a news consumer. Think about the level of confusion that exists. And the problem is, politicians exist to spin. They exist to defend themselves. And so when you're trying to get accurate information, it's not like you can just pull up the, any given congressman's press releases and be like, oh, now I know what's going on, right? Like, I've, I've looked at what the Republican senators are saying. I've looked at what conservatives are saying. And I have the entire media and the entire other party saying this, and here's what Republicans saying, now I know the truth. 
right? Instead, you actually have to read a million different things and be a good reader of all of those things to know what people's varying motives might be, to know when to identify facts and when to identify bias. You have to be a really good consumer of news to have any idea what the heck is happening in the country right now and around the world right now. And that's really pretty sad. Um, this is a, a much longer conversation and we do have time for some of it, but basically when people ask me what the solution is going forward, I get that question all the time. I'm starting with it in my conversation with you all because I think it's pretty explanatory about what the problem is in and of itself. So what's the solution? Can we ever have a media where people feel comfortable tuning into the six o'clock news or whatever the high-tech version of the six o'clock news is, turning to their Wall Street Journal subscription or their New York Times subscription and feel confident that the information is accurate and where we can all sort of say, these are sources we agree on. They get things wrong from time to time. Maybe they lean left, but um, generally the facts that they're presenting are indeed facts. Could we ever return to a time when that's the case? I think the answer is probably not. Probably not. What that means though, we used to have a time in this country where there's, there's sort of this fetishization of uh, objectivity that came about in the era of mass media. So think about it this way. When radio and television arrived on the scene, these are fairly new inventions um, in the scope of human history, let alone actually the history of this country. Most of our country, country's history um, actually exists before mass media, before radio, before television. And when those inventions came along, people had to appeal to the broadest swath of the country possible, right? So that's how you make the most money. The market incentive was to appeal to the broadest possible swath of people because there were only three channels. So if there's NBC, ABC, and CBS, you're not going to win the ratings war by alienating 60% of the country. You had to find a way to present information in a way that was fair and accurate and balanced and people felt that they could trust whether or not, wherever they fell on the sort of ideological spectrum because that was the only way you could make money. It's the same thing with radio stations. When there was less choice, there was um, this sort of idea of consensus on basic facts. And what's happened since <laughs> is that you have this democratization of media, which has been incredibly good because those old media gatekeepers were getting increasingly corrupt. Um, so on the one hand, this is great because it challenged and provides competition for those gatekeepers to actually do their jobs because there is a demand in this country for those sources that we can all agree on. Because I don't know if you guys remember the time when you know people would tune into the nightly news and be like, okay, yeah, um, that used to happen. Or they would tune into lo local radio broadcasts and be like, okay, now I get it, I understand. Um, but pe so people met remember that and they want that. And people want accurate information. They don't want to have to sort through all of the spin. They don't want that, it's exhausting. Um, it's difficult and it's inefficient, right? But that's how it kind of used to be um, before mass media. And that's what we're going into now, is a time where you have all of these competing voices that are competing for the niche. The best example I always use is Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert was really funny when he was on Comedy Central. He is a talentless hack in his new position. Um, and, but he's a talentless hack who happens to be the top rated host in late night television. He's not funny at all. It's just this awful, cringy, like resistance humor. If you watch some Stephen Colbert bits sometimes, I mean, he just had Taylor Swift on a few months ago and I, t I watched the clip. I was like, this cannot possibly be passing for comedy. It's so weak and so unfunny, but that's the number one host in, in late night. How? How is the least funny, but most partisan host the number one guy in late night television. Well, it's because you no longer have to be Johnny Carson to win the late night competition. So Johnny Carson would pull in millions and millions and millions of viewers a night, you know, upwards of 10 million plus, um, some nights around 20 million people on average tuning in to Johnny Carson. Well, in 2021, there's so much more choice that you only basically have to corner this niche 
to win late night TV. So if Stephen Colbert can get all of the resistance boomers to watch his show every single night, he wins. And that's exactly what he's doing, pulling in south of 5 million viewers. I think he's probably averaging like 3 million um, a night. That's really, really telling. So that means increasingly our news sources and our political commentary is appealing to political niches. And that's why you have these people who still claim to be, you know, either comedians who you'd think are, you know, taking swings at everyone, or you have news outlets who still have this, they still have this pretense of objectivity that is, a, is hanging over from their prior business model. And so that's why it's even worse right now, is because they are clinging to the pretense of objectivity while also being nakedly partisan and nakedly ideological. And that's where you get the biggest problem and just about everything stems from that. So when you understand that dynamic, that they are for business purposes, competing for these niches of the population, but they're also doing it under a false pretense, that's where all of the confusion is coming in. That's why those of us who read a headline in the New York Times and then hear from, from Joe Biden and then hear from, you know, let's say a, a Republican senator arguing against Joe Biden or see something that Sean Hannity says about HR1, that's where we're, our heads are spinning on these extremely important issues like an allegation from the President of the United States that Jim Crow is returning in the 21st century. That's where these things leave us wondering, what the heck is happening? Will somebody please just tell us the truth? Going forward, the solution is probably going to be that we're just going to have to be really active, engaged, and good news consumers. You're going to have to go to a lot of sources. You're going to have to find out who to trust, which voices are going to give you the best representation of the alternative, um, the alternative viewpoint. And then you're going to have to find who you trust to give you the best representation of the other side. You're going to have to bring those together and you're going to have to look at competing reports, let's say, um, from the Journal, from the Times, from the Federalist, and bring those all together and try to figure out what is actually happening. Because everybody is spinning to compete for the niche. And that means we're all just going to have to synthesize the information. And it's a really difficult thing to do. And the problem, again, comes down to the fact that it's happening under this false pretense of objectivity. So people don't even realize at this point that they need to bring all of these sources together because there's still this productivity from the, the legacy media that when you tune into the nightly news with, uh, what's his name, David Muir, he's a good looking man. When you tune into the, the nightly news from him, you are just getting the facts. It is not true. It's absurdly untrue. It's laughable at this point. But they haven't let go of the pretense of objectivity, and that's where the vast majority of the confusion comes in. Now, there are a bunch of other sort of like broad categories of media malfeasance that we can talk about. Um, and I think the other one, I, t I spoke about this to the, the lovely interns that were here last summer, is what I've called the progressive or bigot binary. This is a really important element to understanding how the legacy media went from being sort of like center left and then center right maybe on economic issues to being fully ideologically, culturally left. The Associated Press, for instance, style guide right now demands that you refer to biological men as women, um, not as, let's say, transgender men. It demands that you use female pronouns. That's what's in the AP style guide. Now that is a highly controversial position that you can absolutely understand a leftist publication like Slate or Salon or The Nation taking up, right? They're ideologically far left. Of course they're going to do that. But the AP is the neutral arbiter of journalism standards. And this is a highly, highly politically charged, controversial issue that they have just said is the mandate. This is how you be an objective journalist is to adopt the far left perspective on this inc incredibly important, hot button, high profile political issue. So how did that happen? That's really the question. Would that have happened in 1985? No, no. Why? Well, as more and more people in these powerful institutions migrated from academia to the, the mainstream institutions, to corporate America, C-suites, classrooms, writers' rooms, writers rooms, boardrooms, 
they took with them this ideology that had calcified in academia over decades. Um, and some of you in your critical race theory essays mentioned that this is something that started in the 90s. I think you can go back further. I think a lot of people would point to like Kimberly Crenshaw in the 80s, um, maybe that was the late 80s. But you can, you can go back a little further than that. This is something that started picking up steam in the fringes of academia. And it calcified because the fringes are very powerful in academia. The far left fringes is, has outsized power in academia. It calcified over the course of years and became sort of exactly what was getting taught to students and their campuses. Now, I started college in 2011, so um, 10 years ago. And this was totally under the radar, but it was absolutely in all of the guidance that you were getting from like RAs. And it was, you know, what was being taught just sort of as this is the way that we talk about race. This is the way that we talk about biological sex on this campus. Um, it's not even so much what was being taught in like women's studies classrooms, like I don't know, we, that's a lost cause. <laughs> Right, it's what's being uh, sort of it's that it's what is baked into the experience through the administrative uh, bureaucracy at these institutions. And you guys know that you're in college now; you've seen that firsthand. This was happening for years and years and years, though, but nobody was paying attention to it except for conservatives. I mean, when did William F. Buckley write "Got a Man Yale"? It wasn't about critical race theory, of course, but it was sort of about the embedded leftism in academia. And as that calcified, and so as that popularized and calcified in academia, we were also sending more and more and more of our young people through these elite institutions and through that college system anyway, right? Like, so you didn't just have to go to Wellesley or to Harvard to get this ideology sort of pushed on you as objective reality. You were getting this at state schools. And so as more and more people went through our academic system, um, and as we started to say college, a college education is really the only way you enter the middle class and it's your ticket to success in this country. As we did that, more and more people went through the system, more and more people came out of the system to the point where it hit critical mass. I would say in the last five years, arguably like the last two years in uh, corporate America. And we saw that certainly last year with uh, the riots that ensued over the course of the summer. Um, I watched, uh, this was in Black Lives Matter Plaza. I watched, as I was reporting, in last June, it was June or early July, a white woman in Lululemon leggings. And this was just amazing. Like you could, It went super viral on Twitter because you couldn't script this. Like people wouldn't believe you if you scripted this. A, a white woman in Lululemon leggings berating a black female cop at BLM Plaza. All right, so I'm just going to jump to assumptions here. She's wearing Lululemon leggings. She's a white woman living in DC. The odds are that she has a college education and is probably doing pretty well. If she can afford $150 leggings, I'm gonna guess she's doing all right and can take time in the middle of her work day to go protest, she's probably fine. What business does she have verbally assaulting a working class black woman? Well, that's the politics of intersectionality for you, right? That's how this concept totally, utterly fails upon application, and especially the excesses of that concept. Um, but that's how you end up in these situations. More and more people go through our education system, um, and it, it, it fails in, in application. It utterly fails in application. And that's why the country was so shocked last year. And they said, where did this come from? Why is it 2020? And this is snowballing. This snowball is just bulldozing our culture and all of our institutions. People were so surprised. But you, if you had been paying attention to academia, as conservatives were, and getting mocked for it relentlessly, by the way, saying, you know, why are you doing these campus craziness segments on Fox and Friends? Because it's extremely newsworthy, and it turned out to be extremely newsworthy, and everything that happened over the last year was completely vindicated for people who were completely vindicating for people who were paying very close attention to what was happening on college campuses for years, even though they had no voice or representation in the legacy media outside of like Fox News and conservative media. And that's what happened in the media. The media is no different from any of these other corporate institutions, and that's why like at The Federalist, we refer to it as the corporate media, because a lot of this stems, as we just discussed, from their business interests, from the nichification of the industry, and from the business interests 
period. But it also has to do with the way our corporate culture has been, I use the word infiltrated, but that's not right, because it's not like a covert effort to sneak a few people in, it's everyone, has been, let's say, bulldozed. That's why corporate culture has been bulldozed by ideological, cultural leftists. Now, is the legacy media overwhelmingly supportive of, like, democratic socialism along the lines of what Bernie Sanders would want? No. No. That's why I say it's the cultural left. It's the cultural left. The executives at NBC News, they don't want socialism. That wouldn't be good for them. That's not what they want. And that's why you'll still hear some complaints from the real leftists, the true leftists, about media coverage. Um, and the same thing goes for the Russia collusion hoax. Why would the legacy media push the Russian collusion hoax? Well, their authentic leftists were working, not working along with, but were supportive and attentive to the work that people like Molly Hemingway were doing at unraveling this step by step as it was unfolding in our discourse because they know that the legacy media uses these things to distract for business purposes and for ideological purposes. And that entire story is a great example of what happens when you have this progressive or bigot binary that if you, if you subscribe to the Ibram X. Kendi, Robin D'Angelo views of racism, um, and this is what I talked about to the summer interns last year, but if you subscribe to those views, as many people do, let us not forget those were two of the best-selling books in America last summer. It's not like these are just fringe ideas that people aren't paying attention to, and like, oh, Ibram X. Kendi, he's so, the right is so obsessed with him. No, he's a best-selling author. He's regularly paraded around legacy media outlets as an expert in racism, and he believes in the progressive or bigot binary that you are either racist or that you are anti-racist. This is exactly what Robin D'Angelo espouses as well. Do any of you watch The Real Housewives of New York City? Excellent. <laughs> Sounds off topic. It's not. They had an uproar a couple of weeks ago, actually just last week on an episode, you know, I'm talking about um, over racism and anti-racism. And one of the new housewives who actually used to be a pundit on Fox News, Abigail K. Williams, literally flat out said, in today's America, you are either racist or you are anti-racist. And they were basically saying that anybody who voted for Donald Trump is not anti-racist. And if the ones that have guts, they'll say everyone who voted for Donald Trump is racist. Um, but the ones that don't, they'll just be like, well, you weren't actively engaged in anti-racism. Okay, so that means in your binary formulation that you are a racist. That's insane. That's insane. And yet it is the dominant philosophy of racism that has been pushed through our cultural institutions and on our population in mass over the course of the last several years, particularly the last year. It is insane, I'll say it again. And the implication of it, it that, that what that does is it implicates a, a wide swath of the country in something that is rightfully so stigmatized because so much blood, sweat, and tears has been spilled in the United States to improve and to leave this racism in our past. Now, we will never put racism entirely in our past. We won't, sadly. Um, but what, we, what that blood, sweat, and tears has been spilled to do is to strive to be a more perfect union. And we have made a whole lot of progress that then turning around and implicating this huge, huge swath of the country, nearly 50% of the people who voted in the 2016 and 2020 election, and more people voted for Donald Trump in 2020 than did in 2016. So to implicate all of those millions of people in abject racism, that's, it, is, it is wrecking our social fabric. It is wrecking our social fabric. It is sowing distrust in all of our institutions because people know that they're not racist, and yet the elites are calling them racist. And by the way, they're doing it while hollowing out all of their, their small towns through hedge funds and private equity firms. And this is sowing immense, immense distrust. There's incredible tension in the country right now, and it has to do with all of this. It's not one or the other. It's not just culture. It's not just economics. It's both. And it's creating this incredible level of distrust. And it's also just, it's unfair and it's immoral. To unfairly paint people, especially, by the way, what we were just talking about, the, the white woman in Lululemon leggings that I observed in BLM Plaza last year. Let's talk about immoral. For her to scream in the face of a working class black cop, that is not just farcical, 
That is immoral. That is immoral. And it is also the logical conclusion of their entire philosophy. Their entire philosophy is screaming in the face of working class black people every single day if they don't agree with what they're pushing. And it silences working people because they depend on a paycheck. And when the stakes are higher to disagreeing with the left because the alternative is being called a bigot, well, you're going to shut up because you have to feed you're going to shut up because you don't want your family to be alienated in your cul-de-sac from the PTA. It's a way to disempower people who disagree with you and who happen, by the way, to be working class. Now, you don't get this narrative in the media, of course, because there is this... Have any of you read Coming Apart by Charles Murray? It's the most important book to understanding media bias. Um, it's the, the book that I assign the students at the National Journalism Center. I assign them three books, Robert Novak, Prince of Dark Darkness, Coming Apart by Charles Murray, and Alien in America by Tim Carney. Coming Apart describes how we are sorting by class more and more basically every single year. How we are concentrated in these pockets of highly educated and then less educated. And that is another factor that means everybody in the C-suites, everybody in the corporate boardrooms, everybody in the corporate media, as we just discussed, comes from a similar background. And they have similar sort of socioeconomic interests and similar ideological interests. That's very telling because it explains to the point where, explains the point to which the media is now blinded to its bias. They don't see certain things as bias. So like they don't see, let's take the AP example again, they don't see the Associated Press mandating um, leftist embrace of gender pronouns. That is not seen as a bias. That's seen as decency, right? And so when you expand, when you embark on these wonderful journeys of definition inflation, in definition inflation words like racism, uh, bigotry, white supremacy, even violence, I remember when I was in college at my YAF chapter, um, I was called violent. Uh, I'd say, I, they said that I had, the, the LGBT group on campus said that I had committed an act of violence against the transgender community because I had opposed mandatory sensitivity trainings on those issues as the head of the YAF chapter. An act of violence, violence, violence. Okay, so we can't even agree anymore on the definition of basic terms and concepts like violence like bigotry. We can't even agree on what that means. That's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. And when you have the entire um, elite, the, the, all of the sort of people who haunt the corridors of power in this country, not only in agreement with an ideological position on that, for all the reasons Charles Murray talks about in terms of sorting, um, and what we were just talking about in terms of academia and pushing more and more people through the college system. When you have that concentration of ideology, the group think also blinds you from your ability to identify bias. And so that's why you have the Associated Press mandating that, that people embrace, to be fair and objective journalists, embrace pronoun ideology. Because they see that, again, as decency. Not as a biased political position, not as an ideological position, but as a position in the ideology of decency, right? Sure, make that argument, right? But that completely discredits the huge portion of the country, more of the country. I guarantee you, if you sat down and talked to people about this, you would have at least half the country, if not more than half the country, people just saying, no, 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 this is not helpful. When I'm reading this through in the New York Times and it refers to somebody as they, I have no idea what the hell is going on, right? <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on. Um, and so when you have that happening, you have the blindness to the bias. That's how you get things exactly like the Russia collusion hoax. Because they were all so blinded. They were all so blinded. Here's what happened in those stories. Here's a little media insight. You had Fusion GPS. Do you guys know about Fusion GPS? Fusion GPS was a communications firm founded and staffed by former Wall Street Journal reporters. This is going to sound so fantastical that it couldn't possibly be true, but I assure you that it is. Staffed by former Wall Street Journal reporters who were shopping around Christopher Steele's dossier to media outlets to selectively plant stories that would discredit Donald Trump and would paint him as a Russian asset, 
based on Christopher Steele's dossier. He's a former British spy, um, was said to be fairly reputable, but that's also in question. So what happens on the media's end? This is perfectly normal. People from uh, communications firms come to reporters all of the time, and they always have political goals, right? That's what they're paid to do. That's why they get money. That's why somebody would want in, in politics would want to hire former Wall Street Journal reporters to pitch this, because they know how to get these stories into the media. It happens all the time. So if you're a journalist, and this information is presented to you, this dossier compiled by Christopher Steele, and it's brought to you by these people that, you know, you used to see them at book parties at the Wall Street Journal, and you probably still talk to them a little bit here and there. They usually have good info, um, and you can trust them. They're former reporters. So they come to you with this dossier from Christopher Steele. That's the Russia collusion hoax. They started running these uncritical stories where they regurgitated the steel opposi opposition research on Trump, which turned out to be wildly uncredible, right? Like, it was easy to poke holes in the dossier. As soon as BuzzFeed made the decision to publish it, it became easier and easier to say, what is this information? And what was happening in the legacy press, the people at the top of their journalism profession, they were misinforming the country because they were so blinded by their assumption that Donald Trump must, oh, he's Donald Trump, yeah, the, 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 uh, the situation with the hotel room in Moscow, you guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. All right. They're like, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, that sounds like something Donald Trump would do. And when you're so blinded by that bias, you end up not doing your due diligence as a reporter and not poking the holes and not even having the will or the necessary skepticism, the healthy skepticism that you would need to poke those holes in the dossier. Some people eventually did that. Molly Hemingway um, and some of my colleagues at The Federalist did the heavy lifting and were relentlessly mocked for it and attacked for it. Got so much hate for doing what ultimately turned out to be vindicated and true and real journalism and much better journalism than whatever Ken Delanian at NBC News was regurgitating from Fusion GPS from Christopher Steele. It sounds wild, like, it sounds way too crazy to be true. It sounds like something out of a spy novel. It's actually what was happening and because reporters were too blinded, you guys know the Covington Catholic case? Let's talk about that one. You have conservative uh, white kids on the National Mall in Make America Great Again hats. You have this snippet of an exchange via a viral video that's making the rounds on Twitter where Native American activists are in a clash with those kids in the MAGA hat, MAGA hats. And because it absolutely comported with the assumptions of the majority of people in the corporate media, in the legacy media, they ran with it. Nick Sandman was smeared in CNN and the Washington Post because they didn't pause to say, we need to be skeptical of the Native American activist side of the story. We're just gonna be skeptical of Sandman's story. We're not gonna apply any of that degree of skepticism to the other side. It is exactly what happened in the Covington Catholic case. That story snowballed to the point where a lot of people probably still think Nick Sandman is evil and did the wrong thing. Literal fake news coming from the people who are allegedly the staunchest opponents of fake news. This is unbelievable. But that's what happens when you are in these sort of, I mean, the word that a lot of people use would be like a hive mind, right? <laughs> the hive mind. So when you are in these, the concentration that Murray describes of people sort of coming from the same academic backgrounds that end you now in the same cultural and economic backgrounds, when you end up concentrating at those levels, you get so biased and then so blinded to your bias because you've purged all of the dissenters from your ranks as bigots, right? So there's like nobody who is going to dare push back on, let's say, the AP's idea of uh, gender pronouns at Politico. Nobody is going to say, wait a second, this is a bad idea because they will have to talk to HR and they could literally either get fired or endure a terrible situation of public opprobrium. This happened to Barry Weiss. You guys know Barry Weiss? So Barry Weiss was an opinion editor at the New York Times. So she's on the opinion side. She's pretty center left, but she's anti-woke 
And she was very gently critical of the Me Too movement, not like an all out critic of it, but sort of like had some reasonable, arguably feminist criticisms of the Me Too movement. So Barry Weiss has a lot of success with an early criticism of Me Too. What happens then is her colleagues start leaking their Slack chats and their internal communications to like HuffPost and to other people in the media, basically about them like bullying Barry Wise. Like she was getting bullied by other adult employees at the New York Times for having like heterodox ideas on Me Too that were expressed with extreme like sensitivity. I mean, it's not like she was all out culture warrior scorched earth. Like these were like extremely sensitively expressed criticisms. She just got absolutely torched internally, bullied. And we know that because they were so proud of it. They leaked their Slack chats to HuffPost and to Slate and to wherever else. And we know what was happening inside. So what's the incentive for somebody in the media to push back at all? There is no incentive unless you want to endure the public humiliation and the professional blowback for just being gently critical of something very controversial. So they purged everybody, everybody. There's nobody left. And I know this because I know people who have worked at Politico and CNN and because we know what happened to Barry at the New York Times. There's nobody left to challenge the narrative with a capital N. And so even people who in good faith are leftist ideologues, and there are some of them, even those people, they're completely blinded when they're biased because there's nobody there to say, this is a bias. Because they got rid of all of them because they assume they're bigots. So you see how all of that is sort of downstream of this binary ideology that you're progressive or a bigot. That's what makes you purge everybody who isn't fully progressive. And when you purge everybody who's, who isn't fully progressive, that's how you get groupthink. And when you get groupthink, you get biased media coverage. You see how those things sort of work step by step by step. You've got the binary, and then you've got the purging of dissent, which leads to groupthink, which leads to bias. That is like an indisputable logical proof. There is no way for that thing, for that to unfold any other way. Once you have that binary ideological formula formulation, there's nothing, there's no way that the rest can proceed um, in, a, in a healthy way. So how do you reform the press? Well, that would involve basically deconditioning generations, you know, the millennials are already out in the workforce, my generation, Gen Z is already like, at least in high school where this is, a lot of this is already being taught, if not in college and along down the line, that would involve deconditioning people about basic words they were taught um, are different than sort of like what the, the obvious and um, rightful definitions of them are. You're not gonna do that. You can try. It's not gonna happen in, a, in an efficient or healthy or constructive way. It's gonna be really painful. But that means we have to be better consumers of news. That means we have to empower, because even people who have been taught these things, and you know this because they're your friends, I'm sure, they're desperate for the truth. They're desperate for the truth. Even the leftist ideologues, they're desperate for the truth. They want to know what's real and what's not. Nobody wants to be in a sort of artificial reality. People want correct information. So the way to do that is, of course, first to sort of convince people that this binary is wrong, right? Like, you can be a conservative who voted for Donald Trump. You can be white, you can be black, and you can actually have political differences with the far progressive cultural left but you can not be racist, right? Like that's not an immediately disqualifying character trait. So once you can get past that hurdle, it opens everything wide. Like you can start having all of these different conversations and you can start talking about economics. We can't even talk about that now until we get past this first point. We can't even talk about what the appropriate tax rate is. When I got to college, Occupy Wall Street was happening. My freshman, uh, 
my first first freshman semester, Occupy Wall Street was happening. And what we talked about in our YAF chapters was the 99 versus the 1%. We talked about economics and limited government. We can't even get to those conversations now because we can't agree on the premise anymore. And you know this because you're in college right now, right? Like all of those conversations about like income inequality have been replaced by these culture war conversations about racism, and gender, all that good stuff. And it's because we can't even accept the same premise on those issues. So we can't even begin to talk about the others. That's what's happening on voting rights right now, right? Like we can't have a constructive debate on voting rights because the President of the United States is out there saying, it is the new 21st century Jim Crow if you think HR1 is a bad bill as even the ACLU does. We can't even get past this part. So the first step is to acknowledge that that's the first hurdle, tackle the first hurdle, and then everything else blows wide open. That's extremely difficult extremely difficult, but it does involve empowering voices that have migrated to places like Substack. Because Substack, Patreon, podcasts, YouTube, these are the places, um, independent media, these are the places where you can empower those voices that we can all listen to and take in. You know, We can listen to um, Barry Weiss, we can listen to Matt Taibbi, the, a far leftist and a centrist like, like Barry and Matt. We can listen to them can read the Federalist, independent media like that, and we can say, I think I have a better idea of what's going on here, because these are the facts as presented by the center, left, and the right. The center and the right agree on this thing. The left actually agrees with this criticism, and you can see it here. So I think I have a pretty good idea of what's real and what's not. You're just going to have to sort of synthesize all of these different voices, and the country just needs to accept that that's the future, because the pretense isn't going anywhere from the legacy media. There's this new, I'll just end on this point, because of, the, because of this binary formulation, there's this mounting idea in the legacy media among young employees that we need to dispense with what they call both sidesism. Both sidesism, which is to say, we give equal weight to Donald Trump's claims and then to the Democrats' claims. So on any given issue, they believe, they really believe the legacy media will give equal weight to Trump and then the Democratic counterpoint, which is not happening to begin with, but it actually should be what's happening because that's how the public, like unless you think the public needs to be treated like a toddler um, and is too stupid that you're like much more intelligent than the public and you can decide what is objective reality and you can sort fact from fiction better than them, unless you think that, you leave it to the public. And that's how that should be happening. But both sidesism says, you know, Donald Trump is objectively a racist, which again is coherent with this like postmodern idea that objectivity isn't even real. There are college newspapers where op-eds have been published saying that the concept of objectivity is a figment of white supremacy. Okay, so set that aside, it already makes this idea that there's objective racism entirely incoherent with their worldview if they really sat down to think about it. Um, so when you have that happening, you cannot give equal weight to, let's say, um, full, like you wouldn't give equal weight to the claims of the KKK and then the claims of Martin Luther King, right? You wouldn't do that. So you can't do that with Donald Trump. <laughs> That's crazy. And that's actually an, a mounting perception among people in the news media. And it's not just to treat Donald Trump that way, it's to, it's to treat all Republicans that way, and all conservatives that way, and even center leftists like Barry Weiss that way. Anybody who's not fully progressive, we treat them as a full racist, and this, they do not deserve equal weight. So that's, that's a rising philosophy. We'll see if it actually takes shape. I think it probably implicates too many people in the media itself, in the sort of business side, to really catch hold. We'll see. But we just need to be, to end where we started, we just need to be more educated consumers of news. We need to be more active consumers of news because we're just going to need to go to more sources. We're gonna to need to synthesize that information. We're going to know who, need to know who we trust, who we don't trust, which voices to tune into, which voices to tune out of, which voices to kind of compare. Um, and the, the point then going forward is to empower these independent media, media organizations that are acting in good faith um, and that can sort of be independent of the, the corporate business model. Empower those people on Substack, subscribe to those Substacks so that they can keep doing their independent journalism so that you have something to compare the New York Times with. 
that's how we go forward. Telling people that's what they need to do is the biggest step. Just sort of like dispensing with the pretense of neutrality and legacy media is the starting point. Because once you can dispense with that, people can go find alternative news sources um, to compare what the legacy media is doing. By the way, there are great foreign reporters. There are great reporters at all of these publications who do good reporting, and you can look to them um, for good news. You know, like you can say, this person covers Beijing really well at the New York Times. Those people still exist. Um, they're not the, shaping the bulk of the coverage, but they still exist. So finding all of these different things, but at least dispensing with the, the idea that you're getting neutral reporting from those institutions like the New York Times, that's the first big step. So that's sort of like my overview, as I said, of the problems with modern journalism. I could literally go on for another hour. Um, we could talk about the death of local journalism. We could do an entire hour on Twitter alone and how it's destroying journal <coughs> journalism mm, by facilitating groupthink. But on that note, thank you guys.